Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Secrets for an Inspirational Life. I hope that everybody is well and enjoying life a little bit more. Now, I am really privileged to have such wonderful guests, and it's such a different array of guests from every walk of life and from all over the planet. I have really learned so much from all of them and every single one of them brings so much vibrancy and a kaleidoscope of experiences and their presence is so powerful in their own way that it has the ability to change everyday lives just by listening to the story and today is no different. In today's episode, I have the real pleasure and honor to welcome one of London's most high profile and well known designers, Alan Waxman. Alan is the founder of the Landmass uh, Luxury Property Development and Interior Design Company. It was founded in, in 1998, actually, and is based in London. It is a multi-award winning design and development company which delivers design solutions and bespoke luxury properties worldwide. Alan is known fondly as property royalty, I have heard, and he's known for transforming lower ground floors in much of London's prime locations such as Belgravia and Knightsbridge. And today we're going to hear all about Alan's success. So it is with real pleasure that I welcome Alan. Hi, Alan. Good morning, Mimi. Lovely to hear from you. Yes, love to speak with you. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much for coming on, Alan. Really, I'm, I'm so pleased that you found the time to do so. How are you? I'm fit and fresh, thank you, on this beautiful Saturday morning here in London and uh, hopefully going to have a fabulous day out in the sunshine. So as we say up in Yorkshire, must not grumble. So you're originally from Yorkshire, is that correct? Yes, born in Bradford. Oh, really? I've, I've been to the Yorkshire Moors and they're absolutely magical. Uh, I, I really love it. I love the people there. They're so friendly. So how long... Is it that you've been down south, so to speak? Uh, on this stint, I've been down south about 24 years. Um, so, yeah, uh, 24 years. So I guess uh, uh, more of a Londoner than a Yorkshireman, but you never forget your, your heritage. Yes, you don't have a Yorkshire accent, though, I have to say. Well, I guess that's the, the privilege of having gone to boarding school for 10 years. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. But many people say that to me when I say to them, but you don't sound like you're from there. And they said, well, no, it's, it's where I went to school, you see. <laughs> but, but also, neither of my parents had Yorkshire accents. Both my parents came over uh, just before the war. My mother from Germany and my father from uh, also Germany, actually, although he was born in France. So uh, they had a, 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 a have a sort of slightly continental accent. So yes. I guess I've, I've never been... Um, amongst it, so to speak, uh, with a Yorkshire accent. This is true. This is true. It, it is really where, and the environment that we grow up in, it has a lot to do with our accents. As um, I grew up with a lot of people from the Mediterranean and from different parts of the world. So I didn't really have an accent of sorts. It was all sort of picked up and I knew several languages as a child and English, unfortunately, was one of the things that I learned last. So <laughs> um, it took a bit of time to get used to. Now, Alan, you are a very, very successful businessman. So Alan, tell us about your inspirational story that you would like to share with the listeners about your life and also how you've overcome adversity in your life to become so successful? So the, the, the interesting thing about that question, obviously it comes in two very uh, distinct parts. Um, inspirational stories, I, I think, are, are really from, uh, I, I think, of, of two uh, two situations. One is a story and one is something that happened to me. Um, 
the story actually came from my father, who was a, an exceptionally successful uh, self-made uh, businessman. And he was in textiles. And he was going around somebody's factory once and looking at all the issues that the, the, the person had with his factory and was about to tell the gentleman, you know, what he should change and how he could improve it. Mm -hmm. And then he thought, do you know what, if I'm that clever, why don't I go back to my own factory and get, and get that right? And, and, and that really taught me uh, a lot because... Uh, it's easy to be critical of others rather than actually be self-critical of yourself. And it doesn't mean one always takes notice of it, uh, but the more you think about it, the more notice you take. And I think that's uh, a really good lesson for life. And, and the other thing about um, overcoming uh, adversity um, it was actually a cross-country run that we did at school. I was at school up in the Lake District, and we had a 10-mile cross-country run. And it was uh, arguably the, the toughest run uh, in the school calendar of anywhere in the country. Uh, Sebastian Coe, um, uh, who many of you will know, was a yes. world record holder, mm -hmm. uh, came up for our 100th uh, anniversary. And... I was down to come because I was on the running team, you know, certainly in the top uh, three. And uh, we just had a big snowfall and uh, about a third of the way around, uh, I took a shortcut trying to be a bit clever and I got stuck in the snowdrift. So uh, everybody obviously went past me as I was struggling out. I then came back to about uh, 12, but I was really puffed out. And I was starting to tell people that I had stomach cramp and wasn't feeling good, although, of course, I, I wasn't. I was just, in a way, preparing myself for, for coming in at a lousy position and not being yes. in the space. Mm. Um, but then I, I, I uh, sort of got a bit of second wind and I thought, you know, what bugger this? And uh, I'm going to crack on. And uh, I cracked on and to everybody's surprise and mine as well, I, I came in. Um, uh, third. So it, it, it showed me a little bit uh, of that self-determination uh, uh, and how to overcome uh, adversity. Um, and, uh, but I have to say that during my career, because I had such a privileged, uh, in essence, upbringing, uh, I haven't had to overcome adversity and hardship uh, a lot. Uh, I've had, a, I guess, in many ways, quite a charmed life. But um, uh, now that I want to take my uh, business to a different level, uh, obviously that, that throws up different challenges, which I'll, I'll talk about later on. Okay. Now, this, do you believe that this determination for your whole life is had actually come from that moment of the no, incident no, no. that you speak about now no i don't i think it was something which i just uh went through as as a moment in time and i think that um uh the determination um actually uh is getting stronger uh now than it ever was and I think it's, I think, uh, I don't think it's a one moment thing. I think it's something that you develop with confidence um, over time. So, um, and it's, it's a matter of, you know, it, it, determination is also a, a matter of, uh, uh, you know, motivation, self-motivation, uh, and of course, uh, discipline, because, you know, Every successful person has uh, a massive degree of of of, of discipline, and um, you know, it, 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 determination on its own isn't enough. Yes, as they, the great masters say, don't they, that discipline is one of the most important things in order to reach success. When we have this self-discipline and this focus of our life, now you are an expert in your field, Alan. 
And as I introduced you, you have so many different facets to your businesses. Tell us a little bit about your expertise. Well, first of all, it's very kind for you to, to call me an expert. And don't they say that you need to do something for 10,000 hours in order to become an expert in it? So um, I've probably done uh, a, a bit of that as I've been doing uh, property for about 21 years now. Mm. Um, and I think that um, uh, the, the idea, obviously, um, of starting something, uh, when you start, you never actually always know where you're going to get, where you're going to end up. And uh, my story is no, no, you know, no different to that. I, I started buying some uh, flats to rent out. Um, uh, my first flat that I bought was for about fifty-five thousand uh, pounds in a place called Walworth, which is South London. Um, not a particularly uh, brilliant area, but uh, the numbers stacked up. Mm. And I then bought a few other. Uh, rental properties and I then had a, a a property where I'd literally just given it a lick of paint uh, tidied up the, the garden it was a house and I couldn't get the rental income I wanted so I thought well let me see if I can sell it and I happened to uh, sell it for a small profit uh, so I thought well what if I buy something else and and do do that up as well so I, 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 I sort of went into sort of mini development by, uh, uh, not by mistake, but by, you know, just a, as a turn of affair uh, 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 situation. I then bought um, a couple of floors above an off license that sold uh, alcohol um, on uh, uh, a very busy road in a part of London called Fulham. And I moved the kitchen, the location for the kitchen, three times during the process of building this flat out, the first flat <laughs> of stores. So I clearly was clever enough to realize that I didn't yes. know what I was doing. <laughs> uh, and, and unfortunately, I, I, through hooker by crook and self-learning, I got there in the end. And just to make sure I was on the right track, I actually got a Feng Shui specialist in to come and check it, and she was happy with it. And we actually sold it for a record price uh, relative to the market uh, to a Hong Kong investor. Um, I then bought <clears throat> a couple of flats in Notting Hill, uh, which were at the time uh, two bedroom flats. And I did something strange for a developer. Uh, at the time, uh, most developers were thinking the more bedrooms I can put into a property, the more I can sell it for. Where I actually thought uh, the opposite. I thought what people really want is quality of space. And so I actually put it into a one bedroom flat because I thought that worked better. Mm. And again, we sold them for record prices relative to the market. Uh, the actress, Sienna Miller, bought one, somebody else bought another. And, and then step by step, I sort of started to go up the ladder. And uh, it, just over 10 years ago, I developed uh, a property in Belgravia, which uh, was a muse house, uh, which only had windows at the front. So if you can imagine, it was very dark uh, inside because uh, the other three walls uh, were had no windows in. Yeah. And what I like about property, one of the things I like about it is the, the, the challenge of turning the negatives to a positive. So what I did was I actually um, took out a rear uh, section on the corner uh, of the property, put a glass retractable roof in and a 10 and a half meter waterfall going down to a Zen garden in the basement wow. built and it was a bit like uh, the TARDIS and Doctor Who what you see from the outside was very different to what you saw uh, on the inside mm. and 
Uh, it attracted the attention of uh, another actress actually called uh, Nicole Kidman. And she was very keen on the, the property. And mm -hmm. uh, I actually went to see her um, at the Dorchester Hotel. We had a meeting uh, and we agreed terms. Uh, although, in, in fact, what happened was uh, fortunate for her, she got pregnant, which I'm very happy for, but that obviously changed uh, plans so that she then decided not to actually get a home in London. But um, nevertheless, we, we uh, uh, were very happy with the property. And actually that property, we won best interior design in the UK and best development in London. And since then, uh, actually all the projects I've done uh, on the development side have, have won different uh, uh, types of awards. So, that's a little bit the, the, the story on the development side. And then because then people like what we did, um, they say, well, could you do our home for us? So that's why I then by default started uh, doing uh, design projects for um, uh, private individuals. And we now have my own in-house uh, architecture. Uh, we're registered with the Royal Institute of British Architects and uh, interior design uh, and cater for uh, private individuals, uh, investors, and also work with uh, other developers, helping them uh, sell and design their own developments. And you, it has been a phenomenal success. Well, you know, it, it's been a journey. I, I, mm. I actually uh, think that the, the greatest success is still to come because I think, you know, I've learned my trade. And um, interestingly, um, only last week I had a, another developer uh, contact me uh, who's been going a couple of years, wants to expand, felt that he needed um, a, a larger name to help him uh, bring in investors uh, and to learn from and um, so he's asked me, so I, I will become a joint venture with a uh, partner for him uh, and sort of mentor him. And, and that will be developments we'll do uh, actually in Brighton. And I've actually, funny enough, I've never been to Brighton. Um, so it, it, it's, it's, you know, uh, um, it's a journey. It's an exciting, fresh journey. You know, I, I'm also uh, just applying for my license to do uh, interior design in uh, Monaco. Um, and that will be coming through shortly because there's a massive opportunity there because there's nowhere else in the world where the prices of property are so high, but the general level of design is so poor. So it, right. you know, I, I'm, I, I'm actually um, uh, thinking that, that, that it, it, it's a, you know, a fresh start actually for, for Landmass. And Landmass is something that you founded all those years ago. I, I did find it, found it, yes. And uh, mm. interestingly, the name... Uh, I was uh, going to ask you about that. Where does the name come from? Uh, it comes from an uh, uh, English artist called Julian Opie, who is an ex-Turner Prize winner uh, because he um, used to show his uh, artwork in a gallery that my sister worked in. And because my sister had done uh, English literature and was very good with words, I actually asked her to come up with a name and, uh -huh. okay. and she actually for some reason asked Julian and, uh, um, or, or discussed it with Julian. He came up with a name and uh, uh, I've used it ever since. I sent him a crate of wine as a thank you. So, uh, <laughs> very nice uh, too, very nice too. Yes. What do you feel, Alan, makes you different? I think that... Um, um, I mean that, that that's obviously a, a good question, but I think I think it's it, it's um, a little bit the, the the way that we go about things because um, from from a a design point of view, um, people I think often have a difficulty in putting themselves in the mind of the person who's going to use the property. And I sort of think of that sort of a little bit back to front 
and uh, especially in the development side, there's plenty of people who are very good with their spreadsheets and Excel uh, computations, but understanding uh, how to create the right product is, is, is something completely uh, different. And um, I, I think that we, 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 we were, we're able to, to, to go about that in, in the right way. Tell me, what subject would you like to discuss in the podcast? What do you feel that the listeners could benefit from? Again, that's, that's a great question. And I had a long, thought of, uh, 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 long think about that. And I think simply it's how good design can help people's well-being. Because um, there's good design and bad design. And... I just know from the apartment that I'm living in now, uh, because I just love how it is, even though it's it's really shabby, uh, it's going to be renovated, but I just love that um, experience of the feel of the place and the, the views out the window, and it it makes me happy just being coming home to it. And I there's no reason why... Uh, other people can't have that pleasure as well. And I think uh, because we spend so much time uh, either in our home or it can be a workplace as well, uh, it could be a doctor's surgery, there's no reason why these places can't be designed in, in the right way so that people's well-being can be uh, enhanced. Uh, and I think that's you know, people talk about, you know, mental well-being. Well, a lot of it is, is about your surroundings. And if you feel good and happy in your place, then um, you feel a lot better about yourself. And that's a, a bloody good start, especially when there's, you know, more and more people, you know, suffering from depression, um, you yes. know, and, and having to go and see people to help them. Well, you know, if they went home to a place that they, they were happy with, then uh, that, that, that changes and helps the mental stimulation in a positive way. It is a very important thing, the actual place that you live. And I think everyone needs to make it into somehow, you know, they say an Englishman houses his castle. I think there's a lot to be said for that, isn't there? No, absolutely, and and I think uh, everyone should have their own castle. And but even in the workspace, you know, with just a little bit of effort, you can t you can make the workspace a lot more pleasurable. Um, but um, a lot of people don't, and uh, I think it's a it's a shame. And it doesn't have to cost money. That's the point. It, it's just a matter of having a bit of imagination imagination yes that's so important and sadly though in these days not many people have that imagination maybe no. they're a little bit afraid i don't know what it is people often don't like to speak up they're fight, frightened of ruffling feathers and yes. they're, they're yes. happy just to, to a lot of them are just happy with the status quo yeah, I wonder how much that is, though, about their being happy or they're just sort of accepting their existence in that way. There's a lot yes, to be well, said Well, when that. I say happy with the status quo, accepting mm. the status quo, you're absolutely right. Mm. And then what makes you unique that adds to your success, would you say? I, I think uh, it, 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 a lot of it comes down to product and of creating the, the, the right product, whether it's for a private client, or whether it's um, uh, to sell. And, uh, and a lot of that comes from understanding uh, how to use the space. I, I sort of mentioned that a little bit earlier with changing the, the, the flat from two beds to one bed and, and moving the kitchen three times. And uh, actually, I've taken it to such extent that I've registered as a trademark volumetric design because uh, I feel that uh, so much of uh, what we do is about the quality of space. And if you think about it, in the very uh, prehistoric times, people had a, a, a little 
uh, mud hut. Uh, then somebody put a little fire in the middle of the mud hut. Yes. They had to put a little uh, chimney or open up the, the top so to get the smoke out. Then somebody put uh, holes in the side of the mud hut. And then somebody invented uh, or developed uh, making places out of bricks. Uh, and then stone, and then somebody invented glass, and then somebody then decided to put the, the space into different sections. Uh, so they had rooms, and then they had doors, and, and places evolved. And, and a lot of the developers, certainly in the United Kingdom last century, were, were selling their properties uh, based on the number of bedrooms. Uh, I don't know what it was like worldwide, but it was mm -hmm. this much for a one bed, this much for a two bed, this much for a three bed, et cetera. And, and then somebody said, well, what's the size of it? And, they, and of course, they didn't know because they didn't have any uh, flat or house measurements. They had room measurements, but that was it. And, and so uh, they then had to, to look at the, at the general size of the space and buyers uh, were able then to compare different properties in a much better way. And uh, the way that I have sort of brought it about is instead of trying to sell bedrooms, I try and sell and give people the, the pleasure of uh, the space. And um, it, it really makes a massive difference because Often people, when they walk in, they don't expect to see uh, what they do. And the fundamental way that I go about that is through having an amazing uh, in-house uh, team of uh, architects and designers. And the reason why uh, I, I handpicked them is because of their understanding of space and the way that I go about my interview process is I think maybe very different to a lot of other design companies because uh, each designer or architect they come with their portfolio and their portfolio often looks fantastic they've had plenty of time to to prepare it and uh, they obviously want to show uh, the best work that they can for what they've uh, done to date uh, but to me, that sort of gets them on the football pitch, but for them to score the goal, what I then do is I give them a, uh, a layout of an unmodernized property uh, for them to come back to me with uh, two or three options of how they would redesign the space. Because what I really want to see is how they can think on the job. And right, that, okay. And that I think is the the, the differentiator, which uh, really uh, helps give the backbone to 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 what we do. And I think also our our, our attitude uh, is is very different to a lot of other designers. And the reason I say that is uh, we had some uh, investors come to see us because they had uh, properties to sell in London. Uh, that weren't selling and they asked me to go and have a look uh, which I did they then flew over from uh, abroad where they were based actually in uh, Beirut and uh, they said look Alan do you think you can help I said yes and they said well what do you think we should do and because I think we're shit hot at what we do and because I come from Yorkshire I said <laughs> I don't I said I don't know and they said, what do you mean you don't know? So I said, well, with due respect, how can we advise you how we should improve the property to sell until we've sat down with the selling agents and understand the profile of the buyer? They went, oh, that's interesting. We've just seen three other design houses and all they've done is shown us their beautiful designs and stuff. And uh, I said, well, I rest my case. You know, you've got to look uh, at what people uh, want and who you're targeting because there's no point designing something which we think is beautiful but nobody else does. So it, it, it's looking at, again, uh, I come back looking at it from the person who's going to uh, 
uh, use it. It could, you know, that could be a private person or it could be, uh, you know, for, for their private home, how they're going to, uh, you know, we're doing a project, for instance, at the moment where the lady has a cat. So, you know, we have to design, might sound stupid, but we're designing this multi-million pound property uh, to make sure that, that, that it's cat friendly. And, and the cat's uh, happy. <laughs> and the cat's happy because if the cat's happy, the owner's happy. And if the owner's yes. happy, we're happy. So yes. it, 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 it's that attention to microscopic detail. Um, you know, I, I put, for instance, two dishwashers in each of the properties that I develop. And people say, well, why do you do that? I say, well, one dishwasher is never enough. And, you know, I think most, most people find that. Um, yeah, very, and very true. It, it doesn't cost a lot extra and people go, oh, that's great. And uh, it, it's just thinking from a practical point of view um, so that people can um, uh, really enjoy uh, the space uh, and again, coming back to the well-being. So uh, I hope that helps answer a little bit that, that, that question. Absolutely. Yes, it does. The finer details, it's the small things that make the the greater difference in a lot of things in life. Now, Alan, I'm really interested, and I'm sure the listeners are, in you sharing with us what you would say was the most transformational moment that you can recall in your life. You see, uh, Mimi, that's obviously a fascinating question uh, to many people. and. Mm. I have to say, you're going to be very disappointed by my <laughs> answer because I, I don't have that uh, situation where I woke up one morning and was transformed. And I think uh, for me, it hasn't been a single moment, but it's been uh, something completely different. It's just been a journey. And I think that, um, uh, I think for a lot of people who say, oh, I had that transformational moment that changed everything, I think they're often perhaps being a little bit naive because I think these things uh, um, are built up over many different situations. And, uh, you know, we, 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 you know, how you start your journey uh, for most people is very different to how you end up. And it, it, it's a, a process and, and it takes you into different areas. And uh, that's certainly been for me. Uh, I'm very excited, uh, which is, can sound like a bit of a tacky expression. You know, every so I'm very excited, but I, 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 I'm... No, we need uh, to be excited. We need to be excited. Yes, but I think a lot of people use that, that, that very, word uh, yes. uh, in an over-exuberant manner. Uh, this but is I, true, I, also. You know, um, and I, I and I, but I do think that that uh, I mean, in, in a, a significant and interesting uh, time of my life, um, to uh, uh, to take advantage of what I've learned so far, and that transformational experience, I think, will uh, expand and ignite. Um, as the months and years progress. That is a very wonderful answer, actually. I'm not disappointed at all because I, I totally agree with you. Sometimes, you know, people do have transformational moments that are one of those sort of epiphany moments. And sometimes it's a collection of a lot of things along the journey that cause that transformation to happen sometimes even we don't even realize that it's happening at the time now what is i'm curious what is the most inspirational thing or person to you um uh, i had to think about that and, and i think um uh two people actually uh spring to mind um one is uh, my father, and, and the other is uh, Steve Jobs. Uh, my father, as I mentioned before, he, he uh, was uh, self-made, but he had uh, 
phenomenal uh, discipline and he uh, was exceptionally clever. And the uniqueness about my father was he did it in such a understated and humble way. And in many ways, that was his, his real uh, strength. And um, he, he was exceptionally modest. Um, and I think uh, because of that, his uh, success was um, ever the more, um, not surprising, but, but people um, just sort of, in a way, took it for granted because they wouldn't have expected anything else from him. And uh, he, he just had a, 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 a gift for uh, doing the right things. Uh, you know, he was exceptionally well uh, respected. He was chairman of lots of different uh, companies and, and clubs uh, up in Yorkshire. And uh, he, he just had a very um, uh, gifted way about him. and. Uh, this was magnified by uh, a very dry uh, sense of humor. And if I just share one little story, uh, I was up in Yorkshire once and I was going back to London on the train. I didn't have any cash uh, with me. So dad uh, lent me 40 pounds. And uh, when I got back to London, I went to the cash point, got some money out and uh, sent the money up back to dad saying, mm. dear dad, surprise, surprise, love, Alan. <laughs> anyway, a few days later, I get a letter from my father and he'd, he'd send the note back to me and he kept the 40 pounds, but he <laughs> crossed out surprise, surprise and written indeed, indeed. Oh, <laughs> And, and and that sort of summarized, you know, his his his, his wit, um, and you know he he uh, built up you know fabulous businesses, and also, you know, ironically he he um, he he became president of the of the local uh, golf club, uh, he was president of the synagogue, and he was president of the Bradford Club, which was like a, a gentleman's club. So, you know, he he he. Um, uh, he was, uh, how can I say it, uh, respected in, in, in a light, but in a very uh, humble way, he went about his things. And uh, if I can just share an, uh, another little story. Yeah, of course. Um, um, because of his love of golf, he, he, he looked uh, to join the, 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 the nicest club uh, in, in the area. Uh, but when he went to apply for the membership, uh, they didn't allow him to become a member uh, because he was Jewish. And they didn't, they had a, 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 for whatever reason, they, as many clubs did in those days, they, they uh, you know, some didn't like, didn't allow blacks to join, some didn't allow Jews to join. You know, it was, it was a, a sign of those times. A different and time, yes. Different times. And... <laughs> Uh, and so he joined another club and, and one of his fellow business colleagues uh, who also played golf a couple of years later said to him, you know, why don't you join the nice club? And dad told him the story and he said, well, bugger me, you know, if I don't let you join, I'm going to resign. So he put my dad forward for a, a, a membership and obviously in a quite a strong way. And, uh, um, and he, he, he became then a member. The, the reason I'm telling you the story is not because of mm. that, is because uh, many years later, they, uh, they weren't in a very good financial situation uh, and they needed the club turning around and sorting out. And the person they turned to to do that uh, was my father. Uh -huh. and, and, and they made him president of the club. So it, 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 it's, it, it, it's funny how... Uh, things sort of turn around and and he was not a social member of the club you know when he when he went to play golf in the morning he would have to go to the professionals uh, uh, shop to ask him for the names of, of who he's playing with because he never knew who anybody was because he never 
sort of went to the bar afterwards and had a drink. Yes. <laughs> so he, 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 he was there really just for the love of the sport. Um, so that was just one of his sort of uniqueness and he did a great job. People have said he was the best president they ever had. So that's very, you know, it's a nice thing to, to, to have as a memory. Uh, and the other person, as I mentioned before, was Steve Jobs. Now, Steve Jobs, you know, he had a, uh, let's call it a colorful reputation. He wasn't mm. necessarily the most, uh, uh, loved person. Uh, but what he had was a phenomenal um, attention to detail and enigmatic vision. He saw things which people, other people didn't see. And that's really the main thing that I liked about him. You know, when he uh, first started doing the, brought out the first uh, iPod, you know, the simple device just to listen to music. Yeah. Um, for instance, he looked at 32 different shades of white to get the right white. And, you know, it was that thinking uh, which really put him ahead of a lot of other people. When he started building his first uh, computers, he drove everybody completely mad in the production department because he wanted the soldiering done so it was nice, cl nice and clean. So everything would look beautiful on the circuit board. Mm. And they said, but nobody's going to see the circuit board. You know, it's going to be in the box, in, you know, in the machine. He said, that's not the point. It's, it's knowing that it's been done that way. It gives people that knowledge, gives people comfort that we know what we're doing and we take care in what we're doing. And I've looked, uh, to use that um, in my own projects, for instance, you know, on my last project, uh, we had uh, gates going into a little courtyard uh, before you, you walked into the house. And I had um, compressors made, color coded to match the color of the gates. People didn't see them, but when they pushed the gate, it had that really nice feeling of being solid and, uh, you know, well-made. Mm. And it, it, it uh, you know, a lot of other people would have, would have cut, cut corners and, and, or not even thought about it. And I think it's, it's when you do the things that people don't realize that you're doing uh, and they, they may not uh, remark upon it, but they uh, know it's there. Because what we also have to remember is, we have our consciousness, we have our subconsciousness, but we also have our super subconsciousness. And that sends lots of messages to the brain. So people may not know why they like it, but then they like it. If that uh, helps answer uh, that point. Yes, absolutely. There's so many different layers to us that... Um, you successfully are able to tap into to get the result that the um, client loves. And that's a very important thing. I think in many areas of life, that actually is fundamentally important to know what the other person actually wants. And in some cases is feeling also. I, I, I think I might add, add that, add to that though, that it, it it's very much a team game and, you know, mm. I'm only as good as a team uh, that I have. And um, yes, I may well have the one with the vision, but it's, it's the team around me that, that really helped put it all together. You know, it is a team game. Yeah. Yeah. That's very it's lucky. An, it's, it's not, it's not just an Alan Waxman game. Well, I mean, it's very humble of you to say so, but um, yeah, it is a team thing. I'm sure but you are sort of the head of the team. Well, yeah, uh, but, yeah. But, but they, but they uh, I have to say my team uh, don't hold back if they think that uh, uh, what I'm saying is, is rubbish, uh, which is good. You know, yeah. you, you don't, no point hiring good people unless you, if you don't listen to them. Yeah, very true, very true. Now, many of us, Alan, in our life have a crossroads. 
Was there a crossroads in the road at any point in your life that brought you to where you are today? Uh, I, I think that the, the immediately before I went into property, I, I actually worked for uh, uh, a friend of mine. Uh, be, before that, I'd been living in Paris, and um, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do as the next step. Uh, I did flirt with the idea of doing an MBA, uh, going to INSEAD, um, but as soon as they sent me the GMAT uh, application form, I looked at how many pages it was and I thought, you know what, this isn't for me. And um, what I did though was uh, a friend of mine, he, he had a company designing and manufacturing ski clothing and he needed some help with his French subsidiary uh, and I spoke French and uh, I started helping with that and then I spent two and a half years working for him looking after the international distribution um, he had two fantastic brands of ski wear, one for, called Kili from Jean-Claude Kili, who was the first uh, Winter Olympian to win three gold medals, and another uh, very successful brand called, called Nevica. And that two and a half years was, in a way, my, uh, my practical MBA, because it was, it was very tough, it was very hard working. And uh, I, I have, to, you know, that, that really, I think, helped me uh, prepare myself for when I then went into the, the, the property business. So I have a lot to, to thank uh, for that time um, and what I learned there. And, I you know, I think that um, uh, it, in a way, uh, what was a crossroads for me. Uh, going from one area of my life into another to another and what would you like you know what would be the most important thing for you to promote today on the show i i, I think i think that the 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 point that good design doesn't cost extra money you know it costs the same to put one color on the wall as another color. You know, mm. it costs the same for Steve Jobs to, 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 to have his iPod made from one color as another color. The question was, which color? And, and I yeah. think uh, people, I think, are often uh, uh, miss a trick. And it doesn't, you know, matter, for instance, um, what the finishes are like if the space planning is no good. You know, you have to get the space right first uh, because even if the space rights, uh, sorry, the space planning is, 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 is fantastic, mm. um, it then gives the opportunity for the finishes to be uh, enjoyed properly as against people just concentrating on, on the finishes you know, it doesn't matter how good the finishes are, if the space planning is no good, it just doesn't look right. And mm. that doesn't mean that, again, coming back to cost, it's as important to get the space planning. You know, if I think about where I was born, Bradford, which is now uh, a city pretty much, you know, on a, you know it's gone through a really tough period and, and is, is, is uh, quite a poor uh, uh, city at the moment, uh, and that, and I'm now living in Belgravia, which is, uh, in essence, the other extreme. Um, there was a fantastic TV program called Belgravia, uh, written by Julian Fellows on uh, ITV. He, he's a chap who wrote Downton Abbey, and the point is that 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 yes, you know, I live lucky enough to live in such a privileged place but the the space planning is uh as important um uh in one area as 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 another so i think you know if you ask me what is the th most thing thing to to most uh pr promote it, it's yeah. that that real 
gift of people knowing that they can enhance their own spaces and that good design doesn't have to cost a lot of money and that if they do that their enjoyment and their well-being uh, will be enhanced and it, it's quite a simple message but I think it's a very very important one it is it's it again brings us down to our dwelling and the well-being of where we are and to feel comfortable and happy to come home every day to that place where to a lot of us it could be a sanctuary of peace in this mad world as we know it absolutely now alan i'm interested in a lot of things that you do but one of the things is if you could tell us a little bit about your challenges both personal and professional how you overcome them and also what inspiring tips would you like to share that have helped you and that you feel could help others um i mean they're they're uh, really um fabulous questions and, 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 and uh, really interesting points. And, you know, by, by starting off with challenges, well, again, the, the, the irony is um, I didn't have a lot of challenges because I had such a privileged upbringing. I was very much a uh, cocoon. Um, I, I, I got a shop telephone call from my mother when I was about 20 to say that she got me a, uh, a holiday job, which was a, a ski instructor up in Scotland. But that was the first time I'd ever had to actually do any work for any, any money. Uh, mm -hmm. Until that time, everything had been uh, given to me. Uh, and that's in stark contrast to a lot of very successful business people who you know, would have had weekend jobs, uh, holiday jobs, uh, et cetera, et cetera which they may have grumbled up, grumbled at the time, but actually gave them a, a massive uh, advantage because they learned very quickly the, the value of money and, and the discipline. Uh, so that cocooning uh, obviously was enjoyable at the time, uh, mm. but it didn't, in essence, teach me the skills that necessarily you needed in life. You know, there's the old saying, uh, you can either give a fish uh, to someone to eat for a day, or you can teach them how to fish and they can then eat for the rest of their life. Yes. And, um, and one of the, 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 the challenges that, 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 that came about though, was understanding how to overcome uh, confrontation. And, uh, a lot of people shy away from confrontation uh, because it's not nice. It's, it's unpleasant and you have to obviously go out of your comfort zone. But if you want to be successful in business, especially, um, you do have to uh, confront things. And, and that's very different to sport. Sport, you have to overcome challenges and you have to have determination, but you don't necessarily have to confront uh, different individuals you, there may of course be occasions you do but it's not it's not the be end and end all whereby in business uh you do i don't think there's any successful businessman who hasn't had to uh you know use a bit of brinkmanship um uh, confrontation cajoling uh whatever you want to call it yeah to overcome the various challenges and obstacles uh that they um are enjoying uh, or coming across. And when I say businessman, uh, I have to also uh, stress that uh, it could be a business lady as well, because, you know, obviously uh, there's a massive amount of very successful uh, ladies uh, out there, and many are a lot more successful than the men. And I think from a, a tip point of view, yeah. um, you know, nobody. Uh, expects everything to be easy um, but there are certain people who actually 
who want to progress then ask for help and uh, or they help themselves they, they study they learn they read books uh, or they find a mentor uh, or they speak to a friend but they they, they seek advice and, and that can be for any sphere it can be uh, health well-being sport relationships uh, business, uh, family, it, it cuts across the whole thing. And then there's other people who uh, you meet and they uh, grumble about their situation, they grumble about people, and, and these, basically these are people who uh, are not willing uh, or bothered uh, about helping themselves. And uh, what you find uh, frustrating is most of the people I believe who go to uh, motivational seminars, talks, books are actually looking for a little fix. They're looking for an injection rather than actually looking at themselves. And, and most of them might read the book or go to the talk and uh, 24 hours later, they're back to how they were. It doesn't actually, they think that by going there will make a difference, but actually uh, going there is only the, the real start. And it's a matter of uh, taking responsibility, uh, which in essence, what I'm talking about for mm -hmm. yourself, as against to looking for others to uh, to come up with the solutions and and I've certainly you know uh, certainly the last couple of years I've I've um, uh, reached out to 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 help me uh, overcome situations. I found a fantastic chap to to, to help me. Uh, I call him my brain mechanic, and mm -hmm. uh, you know he 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 uh, uh, is. Uh, instrumental in helping me uh, see myself for who I am, uh, not for who I think I am or who I'd like to be. And then uh, creating uh, and helping me see the path uh, forward uh, to reach uh, wherever I want to go. And interestingly, during this lockdown period, I've uh, started reading uh, 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 a few books by uh, an author that I'd like to share. Now, at this point of this sort of inspirational uh, uh, podcast, people think may think I'm going to come up with this fantastic <laughs> author who's written these most amazing books about inspiration, motivation, uh, mm. all that sort of stuff, uh, but actually quite different. Uh, this is an author, an English guy called Lee Child, and he's written a series of books uh, where the, the, the main character is called Jack Reacher, and actually Tom Cruise has done a couple of films playing the part. And the thing that I like about the, 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 the book and uh, the, the story, uh, first of all, it's a very easy read, which a lot of these motivation books, of course, aren't. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the main character is, is somebody who, uh, in essence, uh, doesn't stop until they get uh, the answers that they need. And he overcomes lots of different uh, challenges through the way. And he, he doesn't take uh, no for an answer. And uh, this was something which um, I learned from, from my father, uh, you know, just a, a little example. We were in Paris as a family. He wanted to take us to a special restaurant, all the special restaurants, like the, the three-star Michelin restaurants you had to book, you know, months in advance. Yes. Yeah. You know, um, and basically what he did, he, you know, uh, uh, he had his Michelin book. He had his telephone and he would ring around them um, late in the afternoon and, and, and sure enough, one of them had a cancellation. And it's just that 
you know, simple uh, plan of action and that character and that discipline uh, and carrying it out, um, which um, I think that, that, that uh, uh, was the game changer uh, for, for him. And, and in essence, um, uh, that's the sort of thing which I think can, can, can help people uh, going forward. That's an interesting one. I'm going to have to look that up. I hadn't heard of him. And I think it's the most simple things. You know, Alan, like, I don't know, have you read The Little Prince by Anton Saint Expuri? It's that is such a simple story as well, but it's so inspirational and so motivational. Yeah, absolutely. But again, I've got the book. Have I read it? No. I might have read the first two or three pages, but then I think like a lot of people mm. uh, that they, they get these books, they've got bookshelves of them, but they never bloody read them and <laughs> they can't get into them. And, and, and they look and, good on the shelf. But... And they look good on the shelves. Yes. And, 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 and with this chat, you know, uh, I, I just find, find it, um, you know, because basically all these books are doing are getting you to do things that you don't want to do. Yes. With that, <laughs> you know, because, um, and, and why don't you want to do it? Well, that can be for a number of reasons, but you know that in order to actually, if you really want to be successful, you have to do stuff you don't enjoy doing. And but that's all these books are doing, nothing else. Um, and if you can, actually get that inspiration from a good story, uh, then it's a, lot, it's a lot more fun and a lot more enjoyable. So that's my, uh, that's my little penny's worth um, on, on, on that score. It's true, the story, you know, in you know, of times of old, the storytellers were the best advisors because the story is always remembered somehow. A good story is always remembered. So Absolute, that's- Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that's a gem of advice. Thank you, Alan. And now coming on to your life, you know, and the things that you enjoy and fulfillment, what is the most fulfilling part of your life? I, I, I think, and again, this might sound a little bit corny, but um, uh, developing as an individual, uh, and, and that goes back to the journey. And you know, it, it, it's um, seeing things through. You know, I, I think the, the easiest job in the world is, is that of being a consultant. You know, a consultant, they know their, they, they know their business, obviously, um, but they, they go into a company, they give lots of advice, they get well paid for it. People think they're clever because they, they come up with some good ideas, but they never actually have to carry it out. It's the company that carries it out. And it's, it's, it, it, it's easy to uh, come up with ideas. The challenge is actually seeing them through. And um, it gives me the, the, the opportunity now of, of expanding uh, my business. I, I do think I am a little bit of a late developer, uh, but I think that's part and parcel of having, you know, quite an easy run uh, in the early part of my life. Uh, and, and don't get me wrong, I thoroughly enjoyed it. So I have absolutely no regrets, but, you know, expanding my business, you know, um, through my network, whether it's uh, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, or even uh, Instagram. And uh, what's also interesting, especially during this, this lockdown, is we have uh, certain situations where we can see the glass half full or half empty and you know within my own sphere of business of property uh, design and, and development you know there's certain things that we can do you know we can work on the projects that we're already working on but it's it's difficult to to then find um, new business at this at this time because of of, of the lockdown situation and also, you know, from a development point of view, 
because we, we, we have a, a, a big degree of uncertainty at the moment, um, a lot of investors are, are waiting to see what happens. So uh, I've been using the time um, as well as, you know, going back to old contacts of mine uh, and, and renewing those, um, looking at other areas and uh, through one of my property contacts, uh, they asked me um, whether uh, they were, uh, I could help them with uh, any art. I said, well, why is that? He said, well, mm. we, we're, we're, we, we've got some clients who are actually looking to buy some fine art. And I, I know hardly anything about art, uh, but I know people who do. And so, Funnily enough, I, I, I have a few art contacts um, uh, and, and they, you know, come up, come up with a few pictures and I'm talking, you know, uh, Monet's, Rembrandt's, uh, Picasso's, yeah. et cetera. Uh, I did a, a, a posting on Facebook and I got 15 people who came back to me from that, which was a real surprise. And I had a, another 20 people who thought they could help me from a, a WhatsApp. Uh, message I sent them uh, and then uh, and it's interesting you know I, I, I speak to you know I spoke to a fabulous lady in Monaco about art and she said well my husband does property so it, oh, it, you okay get, you, you don't know where uh, this is going to lead you know through a contact in Jordan he introduced me to a Moroccan guy who lives in Maastricht in Holland who has some paintings access to some paintings and we get talking, so well, actually, my main business is property. You know, so uh, from, from talking to somebody in Jordan uh, about art, I'm now talking to a guy in Maastricht about the Ritz Hotel in Paris. Uh, it, it's, it, it's, yes. which is, for, you know, which can be, can be bought. Um, so it, it's how you, um, how one thing leads to another, and then, uh, the same chap said, well, if you're helping with the art, uh, do, do you know anybody who's got any uh, old Ferraris uh, that want to sell? Oh, okay. And uh, I said, well, no, I don't, but maybe I know a man or a woman who does. And again, yeah. I, I opened up my network and, and we've done that. And what, what's interesting, one thing leads to another. and One of my Italian contacts, uh, you know, because he, he could see what I was actually up to, uh, and I call this my sort of Saturday paper round job. Yeah, it's not my main <laughs> profession, but it's just for what I call a bit of pocket money. Uh, you know, if I can place the odd Picasso or the odd Ferrari. Um, and uh, he said, you know, I've got a friend in America and, and they're, um, uh, they want help uh, to sell a new uh, car that's just been built. Uh, and he said, you know, could you help? So I said, well, what is it? And he said, well, it's, it's, it's the fastest road legal car ever to have been built. And uh, it comes from a, a mark, an old French mark called Delage. It's called the Delage D12. Oh, yeah. And it's been developed with the inspiration of Jacques Villeneuve, who was a world Formula One champion, IndyCar uh, champion. Uh, you know, one of the best drivers in the world. And it's the most unbelievable car. And I'm going to have the ability to to market that through uh, my network. And, you know, people like property, they like art, they like art, often they like cars. So it's it, it one thing sort of bounces off the other. And it opens, of course, uh, opens your network. So it, it's, um, you know, uh, you ask the question, what is the most filling part of your life? And I guess it's, it's a cocktail of all these uh, different uh, ingredients uh, that go into the pot. And, you know, whereby my main focus is obviously property. Um, you know, these other things can, can enhance that, uh, that journey with the connections you can make through them. So I think it's a positive thing to do. And um, I'm very, you know, interested to see how it all develops. It's because you never know where the road's going to take you in anything that you embark upon. And, you know, as you've just said and shared with us, there's so many roads 
that you can take or not take. But in any case, it always leads to some sort of a destination, whichever well, decision that you make about it. Absolutely. And, um, you know, remember, remember that famous phrase in Forrest Gump where, where he says, Mama <laughs> says, life is like a box of yes. chocolates. You yes. just never know what you're going to get. And, yes. and you don't. You don't. You know, you really don't. And, uh, but if you don't open the box, um, uh, uh, you know, you'll never know. So opening the box is a start. And, 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 and you know, that's the biggest challenge for a lot of people. So, yes. You know, unless you, wish you know, yeah, very true. Opening the box. And unless you try, you will never know. Exactly. You know. And I know, we, you know, we spoke about this excitement and maybe the overuse of the word, but there is a certain sort of energy behind that, that it, it gives this vibrancy to life, that, that there are choices, that there are so many opportunities out there. It's having the courage to take them, I suppose. Uh, absolutely. And, and, but for, you know, for many people, that's easier said than done. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, as I said, you know, it, 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 opening the box, you know, it, it, or, or getting the box is step yes. one, opening the box is step two. Mm -hmm. And then deciding <laughs> what to pick out of the box is step three. Yeah. And then step four is then deciding what to do with it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And that in itself is an adventure. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Now, finally, I'd like to um, ask you, Alan, what is your future goal or vision for your life? Um, I think that um, uh, the, the, the future uh, goal is, is very much um, uh, summarized in one of the films that Jack Nicholson played. Um, and it's, uh, you know, a lady said to Jack, you know, what is it that you, you like about me? And he said, you make me be the, the best I can be. Oh. And I think that, you know, it's such a fabulous line. It, of course, it's a very corny line as well. But I think it, 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 it's, it's, uh, it, it does what it says on the tin. And I think, you know, whatever you're doing, if you can be the, you know, the best you can be at it, whether it's, uh, you know, I've just started water skiing again, whether it's snow skiing, uh, whether it's horse riding, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, working with your team, whether it's uh, putting a, doing an advert, whether it's doing a brochure, whether it's doing a development, uh, whether it's a relationship, uh, whether it's cooking a meal, you know, it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, even, you know, uh, cleaning the kitchen floor, you know, you want to clean it in the best way you can. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, it can be little things and it can be uh, big things. And, and the other thing is, uh, you know, vision for life um, is a very uh, simple African proverb. And I think I'd just like to, to, to perhaps end on this. Yes, please. And what it, what it is, is think big, act small, move fast. And I think wow. that encapsulates everything that we really want in life. Certainly if it is for me. Very and, wise, uh, very wise one. Yes. That's what I thought. <laughs> yes, very wise. And it's a lot to think about, actually, in such simple words. There's so much, you know, in, in one line, there's so much that you can take from that for your whole, whole life. A a absolutely. And, 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 you know, that thing about moving fast, you know, there's that famous book called The Power of Now. Oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, but that's just part of it. You know, that's part of the equation. Uh, it's not the whole bit of the equation you know it it, it 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 it's a combination of those three elements that i think um gives that that 
uh, homogeneous and uh, holistic um, uh, vision. Yes, that every moment so much is possible and it's the only time that we have is this present moment and within that moment there's infinite possibilities and opportunities. Yeah, and you know, there's that old saying, uh, do, what does it say, don't do, people say, uh, is it do today what you don't need to do tomorrow or, or something or, like that? Don't uh, leave for tomorrow what you can do today, I think. Don't leave, for t don't leave tomorrow what, yeah, don't leave yeah, tomorrow some, what you yeah. can do today. Yeah. And, 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 and that procrastination is, is something which, um, um, you know, uh, a lot of us people, a lot of us suffer from, uh, but if we can overcome that, then, uh, we, yeah, life becomes much, much more fun and much more of an adventure. Indeed. And, you know, we have to keep dancing while we can still hear the music, as they say, because Absolutely. life is so fleeting. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Alan. It's been a real honour to have you here and a real pleasure, really. And I have learned so much. And it's well, a delight to hear such adventurous and beautiful things uh, because it is really a charmed and blessed life that you have. And really, you are very, very lucky. And also that I think it's wonderful that some people are very blessed and they don't have the realization of that and what's very you know rare and beautiful to see and to hear is that you do and that adds to this whole charming self that you are well now, that's very that's very kind Mimi I really appreciate those words oh from my heart really now Alan if someone would like to get in contact with you uh, where is the best place and what sort of, you know, social media, emails, websites and that, what's the best place to um, contact you? Uh, well, the best is my, my email address, which I think you can uh, perhaps put at the end of the podcast. Um, mm -hmm. But it can either be, um, uh, you know, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, uh, all these mediums, uh, the company Landmass. Uh, spelled L A N D M A W -S, S. Uh, if, if you Google that, you'll come up with the, um, uh, the website, which is, uh, .co.uk. Um, or, um, um, yeah, I think those are the, the, the main, the main ways. And people can just tap you in, can't they? Alan Waxman into Google and they will be in any case directed somehow. Um, sure, to, sure. To you all right thank you again so much really a pleasure and um maybe we can have you back on at some stage and you can share all these new and exciting projects that you're doing well that 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 then gives me a, a challenge because if we do that then i'm going to have to tell you what i've what i've <laughs> done and i'm going to look a little, little bit stupid if i say well actually nothing <laughs> happened so. Well, I'm sure in your life, it, it is definitely going to happen. So I look forward to it. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much, Mimi. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Alan Waxman, what an extraordinary gentleman and a fantastic storyteller. There's so much, really, that we can all achieve if we put our minds to it and at least... Although we don't know where really the road is going to take us, we can say to ourselves that we gave it a really good go. Thank you so much for joining me today and I hope to see you again in the next episode. Take care and lots of love. Thank you for listening to Secrets for an Inspirational Life. Brought to you by your host, Mimi Novik. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and see you in the next episode. For more information about Mimi Novik and her books, music and inspirational work, take a look at her website, www.miminovik.co.uk.